JD's list of why Monday Night Raw is fucking terrible. Let's talk about it. Would it be too predictable if I have Roman Reigns at the top of my list? I don't think so. I mean, the guy's, the guy's fucking god awful. He's got no fucking personality, right? Guy's fucking booed out of the building every, everywhere he goes except for Louisville, Kentucky, right? Blame it on Kevin Owens. Why Monday Night Raw is so fucking terrible. Roman Reigns gets cheered in Louisville, Kentucky, right? But he shows up in Memphis, Tennessee, and he gets booed out of the fucking building. Chance of delete. All over the fucking place. But people want to see Roman Reigns, though. That's why he topped my list. I just figured I'd throw that up there for the fucking clowns that I'm sure will infiltrate my comments saying, Oh, JD, why are you so negative against Roman Reigns, man? JD's list as to why Monday Night Raw is so fucking terrible on Monday night. Number six, commercials for Viagra every other five minutes, reminding me I should be fucking your sister instead of watching Monday Night Raw. Sounds about right. Sounds about right. I mean, commercial after commercial after commercial. Cruiserweights finally show up. Commercial in the middle of a fatal four-way. Steel cage match happens. Commercial in the middle of a steel cage main event. Fucking Rusev and Seth Rollins. How long did they go on? For 20 minutes? Four commercial breaks. I mean, I don't know how many truth commercials about smoking I should see. I mean, I know smoking's bad for your health, but they should have one of those fucking commercials for Monday Night Raw. Monday Night Raw is worse for my health than actually smoking a fucking cigarette. Give me a break, WWE. Cut it with the fucking ads already. It's absolutely terrible. Then I'll have some fucking... Oh, JD, it's your business, man. You have five ads in this video, man. Yeah, but the thing is, you'll watch me and not watch Monday Night Raw. There's a big difference there, clown. Moving on. Michael Cole and his vintage vocabulary. Bad enough, I gotta hear this clown every fucking Monday night, right? Now he's calling the bully choke the captain's hook, right? He's got no excitement in his voice when Grand Metallic is fucking flying off the ropes. I'm supposed to be listening to this guy every fucking week calling cruiserweight action with his vintage vocabulary. Is he gonna invite me into his home? Is he gonna sit me down in a huge bear rug in front of his vintage fireplace? And pour me a glass of vintage wine that's been fucking sitting in his cellar since 1857? Is he gonna sit me down and read me fucking ghost stories as we listen to fucking Mozart in the background? Give me a fucking break, Michael Cole. Seriously, you are a grade A fucking clown. Vintage Michael Cole. I wish we had vintage fucking commentary back. Bobby Heenan, Gorilla Monsoon, Jim Ross... Good old Jerry the King Lawler back in the day. What happened, bro? Jesse Ventura. What happened here? The closest thing to any of those guys is, is Corey Graves. Vintage Michael Cole. Did I mention Roman Reigns? Yeah, I think so. Um, Number five. Raw has an infatuation with Samoan men with tattoos and no personality. This guy's in the main event again. Against Kevin Owens, again. Coming out to booze, again. Boring us, again. Putting us to sleep, again. Even my fucking ten-week-old kitten fell asleep during Roman Reigns' entrance. What the fuck does that tell you? Get this guy off my television. There's a reason why he's on my t-shirt. 1.88 ratings last week for Monday Night Raw. What's the over and under about them topping that fucking rating this week? I, I think it's going to be under. I'd be shocked if they do anything above a 1.88. Give me a fucking break. What'd you have, Braun Strowman versus Sin Cara again tonight? Yeah, that's really gonna drive the fucking ratings up. Number three. WWE presents itself as having Alzheimer's disease. Well, JD, what does this mean? 
What does this mean? What do you mean by that? Well, um, the Monday Night Raw after Finn Balor won the, the I was going to say the Cruiserweight Championship, the Universal, might as well, the Universal Championship, right? And he had to relinquish the title. Stephanie McMahon made a blunder right out of the gate. We're going to crown the first ever Universal Champion. And we're all watching. I'm like, what the fuck? Finn Balor just won the fucking championship on Sunday night. He's the first fucking champion in the inaugural match. So I'm like, oh, maybe they just made a, a, a generous blunder there. You know, anybody can make a mistake on live television. Then she's in a backstage segment and says it again. We're going to crown the first ever Universal Champion. So you mean to tell me uh, Seth Rollins fought an invisible Finn Balor? I mean, did we watch a 2K16 simulation? Did the match actually happen? Or was it fucking in an alternate universe? Was it a hologram? I mean, give me a fucking break. You're insulting my intelligence, McMahon. That's why I said they present themselves as, as if they have Alzheimer's. Something happened, and then the next night, oh, nothing fucking happened the night before. What are you talking about? I don't know what the fuck you watch. I don't know. No champion's crown. We got the belt right here. We're going to crown a champion tonight. First ever. First time ever. Memorable. Big. Huge. Monumentous. Finn Balor won the title on Sunday night. How is, how is he not the first fucking champion? Unbelievable. Number two. Puts me to sleep well before my fucking bedtime. Good thing for the youngins out there. You know? Have your cookies. Have your warm glass of milk. Have your mother read your fucking bedtime story. Go to sleep at 8 o'clock. You're not missing nothing on Monday Night Raw, man. I'd rather you guys get good grades in school so you don't end up like a goon. Seriously. Go to bed, right? The, the, the Monday Night Raw. Listen, you, you, next time your mother is ready to read your bedtime story, just tell her, Hey, Ma, you don't have to read me a bedtime story, man. You can put on Monday Night Raw. I'll fall asleep. I'll fall asleep, man. That's all. Have your mother put on fucking Monday Night Raw at a low volume. Dim the lights. The light off the television and Michael Cole's fucking disgusting, hideous voice and his vintage vocabulary will fucking put you to sleep. The sight of Roman Reigns coming out all fucking sweaty with his tattoos. He'll put you to sleep. Braun Strowman coming out. He'll put you to sleep. Give me a fucking break, WWE. What else do we got here? Farmer Bill and Martha. And the reason why I mentioned these two clowns is because Memphis, Tennessee is another one of these fucking hick towns that don't deserve a goddamn fucking thing when it comes to professional wrestling. You go to these shows, you pay money, you step away for three hours, God forbid, God forbid, oh my God, Martha, oh, oh Martha, I gotta step away from, from, from the cows and, and, and the chickens, I don't know if I can go to Monday Night Raw, Martha, uh, I don't know, I don't know, man, uh, I don't know, Billy Ray Joe, you gotta, you gotta wash the house, you, you gotta make sure Old Yeller's in the barn, he's not, he's not, he's not attacking the chickens, I don't know, I don't, I don't know, can we sit there, can we sit there on Monday Night Raw, and then they're sitting there like this, mm, I wonder what the cows are doing, I wonder what the chickens are doing. How many eggs is the chickens gonna hatch tomorrow? How many eggs is the chicken gonna lay tomorrow? Oh, I gotta wake up early and I gotta milk the cows. Oh, I gotta get the pig ready for slaughter. Oh my god, I gotta graze the fields. The scarecrow! He's not facing the west, he should be facing the east! I can't do it! I can't do it! Monday Night Raw is fucking awful. I don't need a list to tell you why Monday Night Raw is awful. Monday Night Raw was built around cruiserweights debuting for the company tonight. Everybody was excited. Cruiserweight Classic was legit. The best thing on WWE programming for 2016. Nothing will even come close. They took 32 of the top talent in the world at the 205 weight limit. That is the new weight limit. That is WWE's new breed of cruiserweight. 
They are not trying to recreate what they did during the Monday Night Wars, nor should they have to go back and try and recreate something like that. They don't need to. This is a new era. This is a new breed, and this is a cruiserweight unlike we've ever seen before. WWE is giving us their new rules in the new era for the new cruiserweight that is going to be competing on Monday Night Raw and hopefully on Tuesday Night SmackDown when they come to that decision because that would be a right one and SmackDown could certainly use it. This breed of cruiserweight is unlike anything we see on Monday Night Raw and Tuesday Night SmackDown. Nothing that Seth Rollins, Roman Reigns, Kevin Owens, AJ Styles, Sami Zayn, and anybody else that you want to mention is doing what TJ Perkins and Kota Ibushi and Rich Swan and Cedric Alexander and Grand Metalik and whoever else you find that's to be an honorable mention in that division. Nobody on the main roster is doing what these guys are doing. This is a new breed of cruiserweight this is the cruiserweight like we come to know and love with the Guerreros and the Malencos and the Jerichos and the Benoits and the Juventud Guerreras and the Rey Mysterios and the Leparkas and the Ultimo Dragons. Those cruiserweights, yes, WCW had a fucking plethora of talent. WWE, my eyes, has an even better crop of talent. This entire show was supposed to be built around the cruiserweight and WWE failed to capitalize on that right out of the gate. They waited till the 10.05 hour. Why are you going to wait till the 10.05 hour when everybody is fucking sound asleep thanks to the fucking boring, stale, generic, go-home show that's generating no goddamn fucking excitement? Why are you going to wait till 10.05 to debut the one thing people were most excited about on this show? What I would have did and in my creative mind, what I would have did with the WWE Cruiserweights on this debut night for Monday Night Raw, 8 o'clock, you start off with a match. 9 o'clock, you start off with a match. And then at the 10 o'clock hour or the 10.30 hour, you have those two guys fight in a match to determine who's going to fight TJ Perkins at Clash of the Champions for the Cruiserweight Championship. What does WWE do? Listen, I understand and I, I, I love a Fatal 4-Way, just like everybody else, but... A Fatal 4-Way is best when it's given to us in a minimal fucking dosage. There's a Fatal 4-Way or a Triple Threat match every single week. So excuse me for being fucking tired of seeing Fatal 4-Ways and Triple Threat matches and Battle Royals, you know, come up with a number one contender for said championship. I am over it, dude. I am over it. It lacks originality and it lacks creativity. It's fucking retarded. WWE has creative writers in place to give us creative ideas and concepts on Monday Night Raw and SmackDown. Having a fatal four-way with four of the best cruiserweights out of that tournament is not exactly what I call creative. It's not. It's unoriginal. It's boring. It's lazy. It's a cheap way out. WWE wanted to pop pop big or wanted a, a cheap pop with the cruiserweights. And you know what? Instead of having... Two guys generate excitement. We'll have four. It'll be it'll be even more exciting. No, I'm I'm of the old school, man. I, I really am of the old school. I want to see one versus one, and the better of those two goes on to fight the champion. That's all. So we got a fatal four-way match tonight on Monday Night Raw. Rich Swan, Cedric Alexander, Gren Metalik, and Brian Kendrick. Not taking away anything from the match. It was the best match of the night. The fucking hillbillies in Memphis, Tennessee finally woke up during this match, midway through, because they didn't know what to expect going into this, they sat on their fucking hands and knees, wondering about the fucking cows that needed to be milked when they went home. Give me a break. Fucking, get rid of your thoughts about chickens and cows and fucking, and uh, whatever else you got fucking going on, your, your, your corn and your fucking vegetable fields, whatever the fuck you got going on back home. You're there, pay attention to these guys, because you're not going to see talent like this anywhere else in Memphis, Tennessee. So right out of the gate, I knew WWE debuting these guys was going to be a fucking mistake in Memphis, Tennessee. Not only that, they don't even debut TJ Perkins, who is now the flag bearer for this, for this division. He's the champion of this division. We didn't see nothing of TJ Perkins tonight. And he's the one man everybody wanted to see, at least something said by TJ Perkins. No, he's not out there. He's not out there at all. They crowned Brian Kendrick, the new number one contender, in this mock fatal four-way. This 
Rush, 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 fatal four-way. Since we have a pay-per-view coming up at six days, that's entitled Clash of the Champions, and all the championships on Raw have to be defended. So they came up with this lame concept. All right, well, he, he won. He's going to go on to fight the champion, right? I figured we see TJ Perkins come out there and at least shake the hand of the number one contender. You guys have been watching the Cruiserweight Classic. Everybody that competed in that tournament up until the finals and every fucking match that happened, when the bell rang to fucking start the match, when the bell rang to end the match, everybody shook hands and appreciated another guy's fucking talent and the match that they had. At least TJ Perkins or WWE should have allowed TJ Perkins to come out there and at least continue that tradition with the Cruiserweights and to shake Brian Kendrick's hand, good luck come Clash of Champions, you know? I didn't expect, and I knew the WWE wasn't going to take the Cruiserweights and keep them the same way that they were presented on Monday Night Raw. The match tonight, it was great. I will give them that. It was great for Monday Night Raw's standards. If you compare that to anything we've seen in the Cruiserweight Classic, it doesn't even come close. Do you want to know why? Because Monday Night Raw took this plate of Cruiserweights, they put it in the oven, they let people go out there and do what they got to do under Monday Night Raw's rules and regulations. They put a few, a few spices on top, some salt and pepper, they put them out there, produced. That's what it felt like. It felt like Cruiserweights, but it felt like Cruiserweights on Monday Night Raw. It didn't feel like cruiserweights like we've seen on the WWE Network. They were, they were allowed to do things here and there. We've seen things that we normally don't see on Monday Night Raw. But it was still, in my eyes, and when I'm watching it, I see this. It just feels to me like it was cruiserweights in a Monday Night Raw element produced. They didn't let them go out there and go balls to the wall, full, full on. And that's what you need to do with these guys. These guys, out of everybody else on the roster, need to have the ball and chain put away, get rid of it, throw the lock and key away, and let these guys go out there because these guys are going to be your trendsetters. These guys are going to be your show starters. They're going to set the fucking building on fire to get the momentum going through the rest of the night. You cannot have these guys do that if they are tied down to typical bullshit Monday Night Raw rules and regulations. It felt produced. And you're not going to produce a Cedric Alexander and a, and a Brian Kendrick and a Rich Swan and a Grand Metali. I don't want to see these guys produce, man. I want to see these guys raw. I want to see these guys in their element. Unadulterated cruiserweight fucking action like we've seen on the Cruiserweight Classic. So WWE, they did good, but then they did a lot bad. So it's like 50-50. Every, everything with Monday Night Raw is so fucking goddamn 50-50. It's never either fucking great or fucking terrible. It's always... You know, it's good here, but then there's also bad. It's like they're, they're, they're afraid to fucking push the limits. They're afraid to push the boundaries when something new happens. They're afraid to push the limits and the boundaries with a storyline or a character or turning someone fucking babyface or heel. They're just afraid. They're afraid of doing the right thing. And it frustrates me as a fucking fan. You can't have that happen. The one thing people were looking forward to most on this go-home show had nothing to do with Clash of the Champions. Nothing. It had everything to do with the Cruiserweights. And still, WWE finds a way to fuck it up. It was good. It was the best thing on the show. But it should have been the best thing on the show because of what they did in the Cruiserweight Classic. Not because of some generic default reason. Oh, the Cruiserweights are here. This is the best thing on the show. We have a go-home show. And these guys mean more to us watching at home than anything else that happened on that show, man. It is fucking so frustrating as a fan. And I hope you guys understand where I am coming from. All jokes aside, you know, that's just how I feel. That is honestly just how I feel about literally everything that happened on Monday Night Raw. And if there was no Cruiserweights, I honestly would have been playing Destiny and I would have been grinding before Rise of Iron, and I wouldn't give two shits about this go-home show. I honestly just do not care. So, we're going to go over Monday Night Raw results very quickly. Honestly, nothing happened on this show. And there were a few instances where nothing really made sense to me at all for a go-home show. We have the go-home show. Obviously, Mick Foley comes out, and he 
wanted to punish Seth Rollins for interfering in the match last week, last week's main event. And then we've seen the return of Rusev. So Reigns comes out, and he gets the show started instead of the Cruiserweights. Don't understand that decision. So before Reigns even utters a word, he had his best promo of all time. And Roman Reigns' best promo of all time, an interruption. He didn't get one word out before Stephanie McMahon came out and cut him off. Then we have Mick Foley come out. And again, the general managers and the fucking commissioners pandering to their own personal vendetta and their agendas, leaving the superstar second and the authority figures high and mighty, as always on Monday Night Raw. I've seen Mick Foley how many fucking times in the show? About seven, eight times. But the talent is number one, right? The talent is supposed to be number one, yet I'm seeing Mick Foley eight fucking times on Monday Night Raw. I should be seeing Mick Foley once, if that, zero times. He should have the show fucking booked and should, and should only be appearing on the show when there's a dilemma or there's a fucking volatile situation. No, he's on the show. He's introducing the cruiserweights and fucking up their names and he's fucking up introducing the cruiserweights and this and that. So why am I watching a show that is heavily endorsing authority figures over the people that are actually providing the in-ring action. I, I don't get it. And this is something that was so great on that first Monday Night Raw of the new era, following SummerSlam. What happened? We had all that shit. We had all that shit. Oh, not SummerSlam. The first Monday Night Raw of the new era. Not following SummerSlam. I'm sorry. Where Finn Balor ascended the heights of WWE and he beat all those guys in one night, right? And the Monday Night Raw where Kevin Owens won the WWE Universal Championship. How many times did we see the authority figures on that one Monday Night Raw following the, the, the brand split? That first new era Monday Night Raw. We've seen them once. They let you know the new championship's coming. They let you know what's happening, this and that, and then disappeared. Everything was about the in-ring action. So why am I seeing Mick Foley and Stephen McMahon fucking over a dozen times on this show? Fucking annoying, and it frustrates me as a fan. Again, it, it insults our intelligence. So Foley comes out, and... He books Rusev versus Rollins for tonight. Reigns will be getting a U.S. title shot. Again, rewarding Roman Reigns for no reason. But it makes sense. I'd rather him fighting for the U.S. title than the, than the Universal Championship. So he's fighting Rusev on Sunday. I'm pretty sure that Roman Reigns is going to end up beating Rusev for the United States Championship. And Foley goes into a discussion of Raw versus SmackDown. And he just flat out says that he might be out of a job if they start losing the ratings war to SmackDown. So Kevin Owens versus Reigns is booked for tonight as well. That brings out Owens, and he has a problem with that. And then obviously Foley again interjects and says that this will be a steel cage match. Non-title, nothing on the line, just a rematch from last week. WWE's like, ah, you know what? There's nothing on the line. This match is of no importance. Nobody gives a fuck, but we'll put them in a steel cage. So that's, that's WWE's answer to a 1.88 rating by putting a boring Roman Reigns character that nobody fucking cares about against Kevin Owens, who's being blamed for low ratings, inside a steel cage. So when Monday Night Raw draw, draws a 1.7 or a 1.6, who's going to be to blame? Blame it on Owens again? When Roman Reigns is just right there next to him in that steel cage match? Did Kevin Owens fight himself in the steel cage match? You got to blame both. You can't blame one. So... Steel cage match makes no sense. The cage match was nothing but a cheap fucking excuse to garner a higher rating than they did last week. That's all that was. Cheesy gimmick. Steel cage matches always end up the same fucking way. It's either someone interferes or someone wins clean and then they lock the fucking door and then the baby face or the heel tries to get inside the cage. Same shit. Nothing new in terms of WWE steel cage matches. Rusev versus Seth Rollins. You know, first time these guys are fighting. It was an interesting dynamic. Not one that I'm going to be clamoring or excited to see anytime soon. Seth Rollins and Rusev went on to a double countout. 11 minutes and 52 seconds. This match spilled outside the ring. They were battling by the announce desk. Seth Rollins did a crossbody dive onto Rusev, onto the concrete, right in front of where the announce desk now is placed on top of the stage. They were fighting, they were fighting right there on the floor, right below the announce desk, and Seth Rollins did a crossbody block on Rusev there as they both go away and go to commercial. There's really nothing here of importance. It was nothing but a, a, a commissioner-booked match or a GM-booked match by Foley because both of these guys interfered in the main event last weekend. So he figured, you know what, these two guys are 
going to be punished. Let me punish them by putting them in a match together on Monday Night Raw. I don't see what type of punishment that is, but according to Mick Foley, that makes sense to me. Someone with logic, someone with their fucking brain, this is not punishment, and it doesn't make any sense as well. Dana Brooke starts yelling at Mick Foley about last week's double pin. Didn't we talk about the fucking double pin that I knew they were going to bring up? And we were all wondering, JD, was this on purpose? Everybody everybody pinpointed the double pin. They played it off like nothing happened. They played it off as Sasha Banks won. Then they come around and probably watch the tape on fucking Friday morning. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Charlotte and, or Bailey and Sasha had a double pin. Maybe we should make a triple threat match. So instead of having a one-on-one situation at Clash of the Champions, WWE, again, these multi-women, multi-man matches that they're fucking overdoing in 2016. Fucking 2015 was the year of the fucking eight-man tag. 2016 is the year of the Fatal 4-Way and the Triple Threat match. Enough is enough, man. I knew they were going to make mention of this. They didn't make mention of it last week. All of a sudden, this week, it's a storyline out of fucking left field. So what do they do? They make a triple threat match. Now it's Bailey, Sasha, and Charlotte at Clash of the Champions in a triple threat match for the WWE Raw's Women's Championship. So I don't know how excited I'm supposed to be about that. I would have much rather see Sasha versus Charlotte with Sasha getting the win and then her and Bailey slow building towards WrestleMania 33 and them and their relationship slowly start breaking down. If WWE has enough creative juice in that fucking machine, their relationship slowly start breaking down until we get to WrestleMania when fucking blood is about to boil over and they give us one hell of a women's match at WrestleMania 33 in Orlando. But I don't think WWE has enough in the tank to get us through fucking October. Never mind WrestleMania. So I'm just living a dream by giving you guys that scenario. Braun Strowman versus Sin Cara. Um, excuse me if I actually went to go take a fucking dump after the lunch I had today, which was Smash Burger, a bacon cheddar shack with cheese fries. It all came up right during Braun Strowman's match. Do I have any regrets? Of course not. You didn't miss anything. Braun Strowman versus Sin Cara, power slam at one minute, one minute and 54 seconds. And then WWE wants to know why their ratings are in the fucking toilet because of shit like this. Charlotte and Dana Brooke versus Bailey and Sasha Banks. That's your review right there. Shrugging my shoulders. Big boot to Bailey. Bailey got pinned. I don't think that was the right move. I really don't think Bailey should have been pinned. I don't think Bailey should be should be pinned right now at all on the main roster. But they figured, you know what? Bailey's here. We'll just have her job out. You know, she's in the championship match anyway. It really doesn't matter. But regardless of that, you got Charlotte and Dana Brooke beating Bailey and Sasha Banks at 11 minutes, and Bailey did eat the pinfall. Bo Dallas versus Gary Graham. This one went 1 minute and 18 seconds. Bo Dallas beat Gary Graham with the roll of the dice finisher. And again, I ask you, this is, you know, this is their counteract for a 1.88 rating. Bo Dallas squash matches. And this all happened within the first hour and 20 minutes, folks. Seriously. You want to you wanna ask me on Twitter, JD, did I miss anything during the first hour of Monday Night Raw? Yeah, you missed a fucking snooze fest. You missed a one hour nap because most of us were falling asleep by 8.15. This is absolutely dreadful. A go-home show. This is a go-home show for Clash of the Champions. Keep that in mind. Cesaro versus Sheamus. Do I even need to tell you what happened here? Honestly. Like, we didn't know Cesaro was going to come back and tie the series up 3-3. Cesaro beat Sheamus with a neutralizer. Cesaro's transformation into the mummy is almost complete. I'm assuming he's going to full, he's going to reach full regeneration on Sunday night at Clash of the Champions, you know, you ever watched the movie with Brendan Fraser, The Mummy, where he, he he meets the mummy in the fucking tomb, and he's all skin and bones, and then you gotta fucking find those vases all around Egypt, and he starts eating people's eyes, and he fucking starts fucking ripping flesh off people, right? He's gonna be fully regenerated at Clash of the Champions. That's what Cesaro reminds me of, with all the fucking bandages that he comes out with. So he wins, 3-3, neutralizer, and what, I, what I've been telling you, I said this on Off the Script, Sheamus loses one more, He's considered the fucking biggest scrub, biggest loser in all of WWE for losing four straight matches. It was either it was either get Cesaro over or at least try and get him over with a monumental 4-3 victory coming back from 3-0, or you're going to go to the depths and fucking kill Sheamus completely. It's either one or the other. So it's like they're sacrificing Sheamus for Cesaro. There's no way Cesaro... 
you know, is going to gain the momentum that we all expect him to. And there's no way Sheamus is going to fucking come back from losing four matches in a row to Cesaro. So you're doing nothing with this feud. You're doing absolutely nothing. You think Cesaro's going to get a WWE Universal Championship match? You think he's going to get any title match at all? If WWE was smart, they would weave this into a storyline and say, Fuck you, Cesaro. You're not getting a storyline. Uh, you're not gonna, getting a fucking title match. And you'll weave that into a storyline. And then put him on SmackDown. That's all you gotta do. That's all you gotta do. He doesn't fit on Monday Night Raw. He is the caliber of athlete that would fit perfectly on SmackDown. Weave this into a storyline. Fuck him over without giving him a title shot. You know, and just get him, on his, get him on his way to SmackDown. Do something along those lines. Be creative for once. You're a creative fucking writer. In the WWE. Show me how to be creative. Not that difficult. So Foley comes out. And makes the seventh match for Class of the Champions. When Jericho comes into his office. Jericho accuses him of never being a fan. But Foley brings up. Recommending him to Paul Heyman for ECW. Chris has a list. Of Jericho. Or a list of grievances. Which now include a bad fashion sense. As you might expect, Foley brings up the scarf that Jericho's wearing. This is very big in Luxembourg, says Jericho. Foley says, well, it looks ridiculous right here in Memphis, Tennessee. Cheap pop. Monday Night Raw is awful in Memphis, Tennessee. That's, that's, that's what I would say. That would be my cheap pop. Jericho says, number six, uses cheap babyface pops. Time for Jericho's list of grievances. First up, Foley trying to drive a wedge between Jericho and Owens, who are our are, are best friends, apparently. A fan yells at him, so Jericho adds, Brace face in row 12. And he puts that on his list. Then we get to Sami Zayn's phone attack last week. Enzo and Cass come out to interrupt. And this is where things literally make no sense. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Is there a tag team championship match at Clash of the Champions? You figured there'd be something with the New Day and Gallows and Anderson, but at this point, I think we've seen enough, and they've spared us another miserable fucking segment. But it doesn't give the WWE the right to put all four tag teams that they have, the only tag teams on Monday Night Raw, in this segment with no build towards the tag team championship. And then all of this did was pretty much waste time in which WWE could have had another Cruiserweight match, Sami Zayn comes out to attack Chris Jericho. All four teams get into a huge brawl, and then they go to commercial. And then that's it. They disappear like fucking Chris Angel in the night at his fucking magic show in Las Vegas. That is it. Gone. You don't see or hear anything from all men involved in that segment. Gone. I ask you this. How does that get the tag team championship title match over? How does that get Chris Jericho and Sami Zayn's match over at Clash of the Champions? I'm sitting here dumbfounded. I'm sitting here honestly stumped, confused, asking myself, how does that make any sense? But then you, gonna come to me, you're gonna sit on my fucking YouTube channel in my comment section, Oh, oh JD, why are you so negative, man? Why are you so negative, man? I don't know. I, I can bring you logic all day long, and then I'll continue to get the comment, Why are you so negative, man? If that makes sense to you, please, stop watching the product. Because you're making me and the entire fucking community dumber by the minute. Awful fucking segment. Made zero sense whatsoever. So what do they do? What do they do? I said, I said that we didn't see anything after the commercial. We didn't. They went right to commercial. But then when we get back from commercial, we see all 10 men in a 10-man tag. How does this build towards the individual tag team title match and Sami Zayn versus Kevin o, uh, versus uh, Chris Jericho? I don't know. Your answer is as better as mine. I don't know. I, I can't figure it out. It does absolutely nothing to anybody involved. Rich Swan versus Graham Metalik, Cedric Alexander versus Brian Kendrick. We talked about this in the opening segment. 15 minutes. Absolutely the best match on the night. It did feel WWE Monday Night Raw produced. And I said it in the beginning. I said everything I needed to say about the Cruiserweights. If you guys missed it, if you want to go back and listen to what I said again, please rewind it. Or watch the video over again. But these guys cannot go onto Monday Night Raw tied up with a ball and chain lock and key. You got to let these guys go out there and do their thing like they did in the Cruiserweight Classic. Now, 
The Indianapolis crowd at the pay-per-view, I'm sure, is going to be fucking a thousand times better than Memphis, Tennessee. But I thought they were going to have Cedric Alexander win this match because he was so fucking well-received after that match with Ibushi. I thought we would see Cedric Alexander versus TJ Perkins. But Brian Kendrick, they wanted to give it to the one guy that is probably better known than all three, especially with the WWE audience. So they figured, you know what, let's go with Brian Kendrick here. That's what I think that they did. So, Cedric Alexander could be built up as that next guy. I think that's a money match, man. They want to get Cedric Alexander known to the WWE audience. That's a money match with TJP and Cedric Alexander for that title. So, right now, they're giving you Brian Kendrick, who is somewhat still known with the WWE Universe. You know, more people know of him than they do the other three guys. That's why I think he's getting the title match first. Nonetheless, it should be a great match. Kendrick versus TJP at Clash of the Champions. Definitely going to open the show. No question, unbelievable match, can't wait to see it, and I hope those guys get time to showcase what they got. Kevin Owens versus Roman Reigns, main event, Steel Cage, I didn't give a fuck, man. Very, very boring, uneventful, lackluster Steel Cage match. The Steel Cage match gimmick and the stipulation was there to merely try and pop a rating, to try and get people, oh, look at this, Monday Night Raw has a Steel Cage match. You flip and channel from the football game, they figured the Steel Cage match and the stipulation and the imagery of the Steel Cage match would keep people's interest and keep people locked on the USA Network and Monday Night Raw. It did nothing. The match didn't need it. The match didn't even need to happen to begin with, and that's all they used it for. They used it to pop a rating while it made no sense whatsoever. So what happened at the end of the match? Rusev comes out, locks the door, as they both beat down Roman Reigns, he and Kevin Owens. Seth Rollins comes in, and I had a mini heart attack as a guy who just had his fucking ACL and MCL repaired is jumping 20 fucking feet off a steel cage doing a crossbody. So excuse me for being fucking worried about Seth Rollins' well-being after just having reconstructive, possible career-ending surgery. But he's jumping off steel cages. So he came to Roman Reigns' aid. What does this mean? I honestly think that we're going to see some alignment of the shield. It is going to happen. WWE is going to weave this into some type of storyline. The opening is there. If the WWE wants to do it, the club versus the shield. Ambrose now just needs to be fucking royally fucked over on SmackDown. And he needs to join forces with Rollins and Reigns at some point, some way. If WWE has Survivor Series coming up and it's going to be a huge dual-branded pay-per-view, it makes sense for this to happen now. All men will be involved if you want that interpromotional thing going on and you want it to have it make sense and you want it to have it mean something of importance. This is the way to go. And I explained to you on episode 135, part number two of Off The Script. If you guys did not hear my almost 30-minute rant, as to why the shield needs to be reformed now. Not later. Now. And doubting everybody, or the people that are doubting the shield being reformed, it's not the right time. You know, I don't want to see them at all. It's uninteresting to me. I give you valid reasons why the WWE needs the shield. So, I honestly think this is where they're going. I mean, they're dropping hints. If they don't go through it now, it's not going to happen. But the WWE is dropping hints. It's either... Fucking go all in or fucking shut the fuck up. So I honestly think that's where they're going because there's no reason why a babyface Seth Rollins is saving Roman Reigns. There's no reason unless there's some type of alignment that's going to happen there. So they're teasing it. They're dropping hints that it's going to happen. This is the architect, Seth Rollins. He's one of the most dastardly villains in, in recent memory. Now all of a sudden he's blooming into a babyface. He's had fucking wars with Roman Reigns. His main thing with Roman Reigns is that he took the title that was on Rollins, right? And now we're supposed to forget all that because he's saving him against Rusev and, and Kevin Owens? Now, there's got to be something underlying. There's got to be something a little bit more deeper there, bro, as to why you're saving Roman Reigns. You have a common theme now. You both were fucked over for the Universal Championship. You both want questions answered by Triple H. Something has to give. Something has to happen. And I honestly think Rollins and Reigns and their alignment as of tonight, Rollins saving Reigns is going to lead to something bigger. I honestly believe that. If not, again, WWE is going to drop the ball. And why would I expect them to do something right? More times than not, they always disappoint us in the end anyway. Just like this edition 
of Monday Night Raw. This was your go-home show for Monday Night Raw, and this was my official review. If you enjoyed the video, let me know with a comment down below here on YouTube.com. If you guys are listening to this on iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher Radio, Audio Boom, and Google Play Music, subscribe to me on iTunes, leave a five-star rating. And if you guys are on Podbean, leave me a follow on there and leave me a comment on there as well. Audio Boom, Google Play Music, and Stitcher Radio are available for this podcast as well. Until then, guys, I am JD. If you missed anything that I did this weekend and during the week on YouTube.com, please visit me and subscribe, JD from NY206. Follow me on Twitter, at JD from NY206. If you care to pledge and donate to the Patreon account, patreon.com slash JD from NY206. And if you guys want to buy a t-shirt, we are an official partner of Barber Shop Window. It's going to be a busy day on Tuesday. I got Batman Telltale Episode 2, Destiny Rise of Iron. I got a great WWE 2K16 video coming out. 30-minute Iron Man match with Mr. 9 to 5 versus Chris Danger. The start of a best of seven series. Dank Ops going to be on the channel this week. So make sure you guys check out all that. Another great week coming up as we head towards Clash of the Champions. I'm JD. Hit that thumbs up right here on YouTube.com, and I'll see you right back here tomorrow with more great content and SmackDown Live. Talk to you later.